Waiting on the Lord is an exercise of faith. Sometimes that exercise is not easy. Waiting, even for those of us who are relatively mature in age, do not necessarily mature in patience as we wait. Here in Jeremiah 29, the Lord tells the exiles to wait patiently for that time of exile to be over. To trust in his plans to prosper them. And in the meantime, to be patient, and to settle down, to build homes and families and do the work of God's kingdom. So let's hear from God's word. I'll be reading from Jeremiah 29, beginning with verse 4 through 14. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from where I have carried you into exile. Amen. So the work of the kingdom is to invest ourselves wherever we are to whomever God has sent us. And our second reading is from Hebrews 8, in which there is a long quote from Jeremiah again, this time just a couple of chapters later in chapter 31, which reminds us as God's people that no matter what happens, no matter where we are in life or how displaced or disoriented we might feel, God is at work through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the strength of Christ's new covenant. Hebrews 8, begin re I'll read verses 1 and 3 and then 6 through 13. Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by, um, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. Down to verse 6. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, this is again a quote from Jeremiah 31, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not by, be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. 
By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Friends, this is God's word. As Christians, we are displaced people. As the Apostle Peter would say, we are aliens and strangers in this land, in this world. And so we, like the Israelites, the Judites of Jeremiah's time, we are displaced in a world that is not really our final destination, not really our final home. God is sovereign over the course of our lives. And so no matter what happens, no matter where in the world we find ourselves, no matter how displaced we might feel, no matter how disoriented or confused, God is at work through the power of the Holy Spirit on the bedrock strength of the new covenant blood of Jesus Christ, which has ushered us into the Holy of Holies so that we might have communion with the Father without shame, without guilt, without fear. And so while our current environment or situation might not feel like the promised land, in fact, for all of us in Christ, wherever we are, is the promised land because Jesus is the great high priest who allows us to know and worship God, not just in a particular physical place like the temple in Jerusalem made with stone, but in Christ. And so we are God's new covenant people. In Christ, we are both individually and corporately as a body of Christ. We are the temple of God. Building God's kingdom then becomes a possibility as we move into every corner of the world. As Jesus continues to act day after day after day as the living word of God in us. Written on our hearts, regardless of what kind of difficult or challenging circumstance we might find ourselves in. So we are secure in Christ through that power of the Holy Spirit. And we build God's kingdom, even in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. We continue to build and to plant and to invest in the community where God has called us to live. So we continue to to build and to plant here in Marion and in Smith County, to build God's kingdom, no matter how challenging we might find these days, even in the middle of a stressful election, we plant seeds of faith and hope, of joy, of restoration and new life. This is the life God has given for us to live. This is the moment in time when God has called us to be his followers, his disciples. This is the Kairos God-given moment in which we are to work for and give witness to God's power, his majesty, his glory, his almighty power, his wonder, his greatness, his love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. This is the day that the Lord has made and so we can rejoice in it. And as Nehemiah told the people of God, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So friends, today find your strength, not in your own feeble hearts or in your weakening hands, but in the joy of the Lord. The exiles to whom Jeremiah wrote were obviously discouraged. They wanted to go home. They were tired of being in a strange land with a strange language, strange customs, strange food, strange way of dressing. They were tired of all the upheaval in their lives and they desperately longed for home. But God told them to wait. God tells them that they were brought there not by random chance, not just by the strange varieties of history or by happenstance. They were brought there by God himself. 
In fact, in verse 4, he says, I carried them into exile. I carried you wherever you are. It was my will that brought you to this place of difficulty, this place of challenge. So get busy doing my will. He says very ordinary things. He says build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Increase in number, do not decrease. And he says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. Again, he says, it is my will for you to be there. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And so we need to get busy. Even though you might feel disoriented, you might feel displaced, you might feel like you're in an exile of sorts. You might feel... Like it's an exile away from home, away from all things familiar, away from all those things that give you a sense of identity. But know that it's not the circumstances in which you live that, that forges that identity. It's your faith in Jesus Christ. That's who you are. You are the people of God, no matter what those circumstances might be. And so be at work in this place, in this time, in this day. Settle down, build homes, have families. Seek the peace, the prosperity of the city. The word there for peace is that wonderful biblical word, shalom. Rest, peace. Bring God's shalom, his, his wholeness, his life-giving vitality to the place in which you live. Be his witnesses for good. Be at work building his kingdom our town, our state, our nation. Pray for it. Work for it. Because as this town prospers, we prosper. As this county prospers, we prosper. As this state prosper, we prosper. As our nation prospers, we prosper. So let us seek to add value to the economic development of this place. Investing our, our time, our efforts to the educational enrichment, especially of the next generation. Let's seek to bring health, and vitality and richness, abundance, richness in cultural life, human flourishing into this place and time in which God has called us, even as exiles, even as those who often feel displaced in a place that doesn't feel very much like home. Don't simply pine away for an easier life. Wish away these hard days. Know that God is here in our midst and that we as aliens, as strangers, are called to build God's kingdom. Even as we pray over a land that is greatly divided after a contentious election, even as we pray for God to eradicate the coronavirus. We have to trust that God allowed all these things for his own purposes, that we didn't arrive here by accidents, by random chance, that God is using this time of testing. God is using the hard events in our lives to refine us like gold through a refiner's fire. That he is using these times like the potter used the clay on the wheel. That he is molding and shaping us for bigger and grander purposes. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, We are hard pressed on all sides, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. So therefore, do not lose Friends, do you feel perplexed this morning? Do you feel struck down? Do you feel persecuted? Well, know that God is at work in your life. That He is your shield. That He is your provider. And that He is storing up for you 
a whole treasure trove of heavenly rewards as you remain faithful to him, that, that you are not forsaken, that you can have hope and not go down into despair, that you can be struck down, but that in Christ you can rise up again. And so don't lose heart. Don't assume that God is going to make the hard times go away. This has always been the plight of God's people, strangers in a strange land. And so we must work hard to build God's kingdom in this time and place. We must hold tightly to hope and not give up. It takes time and we have to be patient again. Waiting is never easy for us. But the Bible reminds us again and again that waiting on the Lord is what we are called to do. And that everything is done in God's time in our timing. King Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted. And he ends that long list and says, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Friends, do you believe that? Do you believe that God has made everything beautiful in its time? Because God is sovereign over the timing of events in this world and in our individual lives, the Bible tells us over and over, wait on the Lord. Take courage and wait on the Lord. Give your anxieties, your worries over to the Lord and wait on the Lord. David said in Psalm 27, wait for the Lord, be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. We think of waiting is something passive. But the biblical view of waiting for the Lord is an active step of faith that trusts God. Trust that He is always at work, that He is almighty, that He is sovereign over the events of our lives and of this world. And that even when nothing seems to be happening, even when it seems like we're wasting time, that God is at work. There is no waste of time in the kingdom of God. The King of Glory is ruling and reigning over your life and over the nations of this world and its rulers. And He will unfold the history as He deems fit. And so God tells the exiles through Jeremiah, do not sit back and just wait for a quick return to the promised land. In fact, it would last 70 years or more for some others. Rather, God tells them to invest themselves right where they are. Investing in the people and place where God has sent them to Babylon. God has set the number of our days. He appoints the days and seasons of our lives. Don't wish these days away. No matter how hard or trying they might seem. Don't pine away for an easier life. Take what the Lord gives you. Take life as it comes and be grateful for every day. Be grateful for every moment of his blessings, which come not just in spite of these trials, but through them oftentimes. God is using them for our good. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, I tell you now is the day of God's favor. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Not tomorrow when we think everything's going to be better. Not six months from now. Not a year from now. Not ten years from now when we finally got our nest egg to where we want it. Now is the day of God's favor in your life and in my life. Now is the day of salvation. Don't keep saying, well... Once all this is over and we're kind of behind this rough patch, then I'll really get busy doing God's work. Then I'll be so grateful, so full of joy, so full of passion for you, Lord. No, today is the day. Today is the time that God has given us. Our minds, our spirits are so often trapped in the prison of yesterday, right? Mulling over regrets, mulling over past hurts, wounds. 
that we can't seem to put away. In former days, we long for days of personal comfort or glory. We're consumed on the other side about things that are to come. Worried about tomorrow, we fret and fear those days. But the kingdom of God exists in the eternal present, in the right now. That is where the kingdom of God is most fully present for you. So be fully present with Jesus in this moment. That doesn't mean we can't responsibly plan for tomorrow or fondly remember and give thanks for days gone by. But it means that our primary focus must always be on this present moment, on the here and now, which is most fully experienced as we receive the Holy Spirit as it's sent from the Father and the Son. And Jesus is that great high priest that's talked about in Hebrews that is always available to us, that can sympathize with us in every way because he too has experienced human life with all of its struggles. He too was tempted in every way, it says, yet was without sin. And so only Jesus is that perfect high priest. So let us fix our eyes not on our circumstances, not on a nation that seems divided or a virus that never seems to go away. Let us fix our eyes not on those things, but on Christ as the great author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus calls us to follow him as he seeks to remake the world, as he seeks to make disciples of all the nations. The Lord has glorious plans for us. So who are we to question his sovereign timing of this present day and hour. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. You don't know the plans, but the Lord does. You might understand the why. You might never understand until the other side of glory. But the Lord does. And he has glorious plans for you. Plans to prosper you. Not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. When we wait on the Lord and serve Him, God's Spirit will empower us. As Isaiah said, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. Friends, do you want to fly? Do you want to walk and run into the future that God has created? Well, then wait on the Lord. Trust that He knows what He's doing. Trust in his judgment, Noah waited on the Lord, though he lived in a terribly corrupt world. He trusted that God would use him in ways that had eternal significance. And Noah patiently served God and preserved his kingdom, even among a generation that had really turned their backs on God, a world that had become utterly corrupt. And he alone stood as an alien, as as an exile, as a stranger in a strange world, a world that he did not recognize. What is this place, O Lord? And yet he followed God's commands and he followed God's leading and he stood alone in righteousness and he carried on and he built the ark. Moses waited patiently on the Lord. At age 40 years old, he fled into the wilderness and was there for another 40 years of his own personal exile. And he could have simply given up and thought, well, that's my life. It's over. This is where I am. I'm out in the middle of this wilderness and surely God must have, must have abandoned me. But no, Moses kept the faith and he continued to seek the Lord. And he sought out kingdom purposes such that when he saw that burning bush as he was tending sheep, he went up to it and he knew the Lord was speaking to him and he knew it was holy ground and he took his shoes off and he sensed God redeeming his life, redeeming the purposes for which he had been called. The Lord said, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. And he spoke to Moses. And friends, the place where you are standing right now, as uncomfortable, as God-forsaken as it might seem to you, 
know that you were standing on holy ground. Take off your shoes and know that God is present, that His holiness will transform you as you step into the presence of His glory, as you allow Him to cleanse you and remake you and reform your life, your priorities, your loves, reorder your loves. God will use you to go out into the world and proclaim freedom for those who are trapped in slavery, not as the Israelites were in literal slavery in Egypt, but slavery now to sin, slavery to death and fear and doubt. Know that God will use you for a glorious kingdom purpose. As a young man, David worked as a humble, lowly shepherd. For many years, and he never saw those years as wasted time. He knew that God used those years of doing a very humble, menial task for shaping his character, for helping him to see the glory of God even in the night sky. Even as he shepherded sheep, he knew that the Lord was his shepherd. And eventually the Lord, as he, David, waited on him, allowed him to become one of the greatest kings in the history of the world. Waiting on serving the Lord will not be easy. God's never promised you an easy life. But he does promise you a life of purpose, a life of joy, even in the midst of hardship, through the fire, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And God work, wants to do a new work in you. Do not perceive it. Like Noah, like Moses, like David, God is calling you to a life that is bigger than you. A bigger purpose than just your own pleasure, just your own comfort. God wants to accomplish kingdom purposes through the choices that you make, through the sacrifices you make, through the people that you touch. God wants us to plant seeds of hope, seeds of restoration, seeds of faith. And God has an amazing plans for you, even in the midst of exile, even in the wilderness, even in the dark times of down confusion, when the way forward seems broken and disjointed and you can barely see the path before you. God says, I have plans for you. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. So to wait on the Lord means to trust Him. It means to trust His power. To trust an eternal love that never stops. So that even in the waiting, He will use us to be builders of His kingdom here. So don't waste this God-given time in your life. Even when you feel lost, even when you feel like maybe life is out of control, know that God is in control and that he is allowing you to feel the pain of exile in order to shape you and mold you for even more glorious things. Plans that you cannot even imagine so that you can be brought into the promised land of his perfect presence. That that Holy Spirit can be the temple for you, even in your heart. You will never know Jesus as your promised Savior until you embrace the Holy Spirit-led journey through the wilderness of this world. This world as it is is not your home. We are all strangers. We are all aliens. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, even the hard, barren, broken places of this world can be the throne room of God. Jesus intercedes before you as a great high priest. And in the power of the new covenant, there's not just one temple. There are millions of temples of the Holy Spirit within the heart of all who trust in Jesus as Lord and Savior. So, friends, that's the question for you today. Will you trust in him? Will you embrace even the hard circumstances of this life as holy ground? It's God's unfolding plan to build his kingdom in you and through you.
Let's pray. Lord, we praise you that you are a God of glory and might. A God who speaks to us powerfully in the barren places of life, in the times of exile, in those times when we feel lost and alone and abandoned. You are there. And so, Lord, help us in the waiting. Help us to wait on you, to trust that you are at work even when we can't see it. Give us eyes of faith to see you working. Give us ears of faith to hear your word of hope and restoration and to be able to speak that restorative word to the people around us. Lord, we give you all praise and glory as you shepherd us through the plans of your making. May our lives reflect your glory and grace always to the people around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand for our final hymn, God our Father, we adore thee. If you'd like to follow along, it's number 93. We're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4.